These are like taboo. The sign says danger. <laughs> Don't go here. Don't talk nonsense. Uh, don't eat more than necessary. Don't collect a lot of junk. <laughs> don't, what else, a lot of, what else you shouldn't do. Don't just practice the process without understanding why you're doing it. And don't just simply do it without understanding how to do it. <laughs> um, and follow the process accordingly, like that. So we'll get into that. And that's also Bhuta Bhavana. He will also give the second uh, verse. But uh, the schedule is that he'll give the first verse, and then I'll give the third verse, and then he'll give the second verse. Is that okay? We don't know how to count. <laughs> We're doing a little dance around. But the third and second verse are interchangeable because they are the six do's and the six don'ts. So he'll tell you what not to do, and I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> okay? So I like to tell people what to do. <laughs> it's my false ego. <laughs> but he'll tell you what not to do. <laughs> He's more merciful. <laughs> So the six, then we'll, we'll go into the six things that you should do. You should be enthusiastic. You should be patient. You should be determined. You should chant Hare Krishna, read the Shastras, and uh, associate with devotees. Avoid bad association, and you should also follow the process given by the spiritual teachers and not go outside of their teachings. These are the six do's and the six stones we mentioned. So that's the third verse. The fourth verse is, um, so the second and third verses have to do a lot with attitude. So that's the second theme. The first one is mind and sense control, and the second one is the attitude. What is the proper attitude? And that is avoiding these six negative and adding these six positive like that what makes it work what makes it what makes it break down like that, like that okay you can ask questions if you want I'm just going along here so you, if you want to ask a question while we're going along please feel free okay. and verse number four we saved it for the Sunday feast because we felt that the mixture of the guests and the devotees and the greater you know, yatra of Slovenian community will come for this one. And it's how to relate to others. <laughs> it's called the six loving exchanges. How to have a loving exchange with another person in Krishna consciousness in six different ways. <laughs> the six loving exchanges, and how that is also done in the material world with amongst people who are friends, business associates, like that. So, so we saved that one for the Sunday feast, verse number four. Now we get back to the sequence. Is that okay? Okay, so verse number four. And verse number five, which, um, verse number four, I'll be giving the Sunday Feast class. Uh, verse number five is dealings with devotees. How do you deal with each other? What are the different levels of devotees? Kanista, Madhyamam, Uttamam, what are their qualities? What are their characteristics? What are their activities? Where are you? <laughs> Where are you amongst these three? Are you Kanista? Are you Madhyamam? Or are you Uttamam? <laughs> First class, second class, third class devotees. So, uh, how to recognize and how to also to accept 
association based on these uh, different types of devotees like that. Okay, now Bhuta Bhavana, he's, he's going to give you some, I'm going to tell you the do's on that one. He's going to give you some more don'ts. <laughs> Because he's better at giving don'ts than I am. Because when I give don'ts, I become like Harani Kashipu. So, but he's sweet, even though he's giving out the hard, and the hard stuff. <laughs> so he'll give you the don'ts, and that is, how do you not deal with devotees? How do you wrongly see devotees? Do you see them by their material body? Do you see them by their country they're born in? Do you see them by their physical deformities? Do you see them? How do you relate to the spiritual master? How do you relate? How not to relate to the spiritual master? How not to relate to each other? In other words, the de dealings amongst devotees that you should not do. Verse number six. Now this is called Sadhu Sangha. The first three verses are within the category of faith. Uh, and the first four are actually your Dao Strata. The next five and six are Sadhu Sangha, like that. Janaki Nath, how am I doing? Okay. Janaki Nath just gave the whole seminar, right? How many days? Five days. He, put, he did this whole thing in five days in London. How many people came? Huh? Fifty? Fifteen people came and he gave the whole thing. So he's my check and balance man. He's going to tell me if I do anything wrong. Because <laughs> he's he was studying like five hours a day, every day, before he gave his seminar. I was saying, why are you studying so much? And he wouldn't listen to me, so he just kept studying. <laughs> he kept studying and studying, so he knows this. He probably can give these classes also. So, um, yeah. So that's so that's and, and verse number seven is uh, bhajana kriya and an art nivriti, the glories of the holy name. We're chanting Hare Krishna, but still there's no taste. Why doesn't the sugar taste sweet? I walked into a candy store, and all I see is candy. But when I taste it. It tastes like castor oil, or something similar. <laughs> it tastes, it doesn't taste sweet. What is this? Give me the real thing. Hmm. So verse number seven is, the disease of material life causes us not to taste that sweetness. Again, Bhuta Bhavan, I'll tell you why it's happening. <laughs> He's going to do verse number seven. He's also doing verse number six, too. Okay. And then, as, after he tells you and you clear it up, then I give you verse number eight. Now, verse number eight is one of the most important and powerful verses in this whole series. It's the nectar of the chanting of the holy names. It's the stage where you reach chanting of the holy names and you're actually tasting the happiness and sweetness of Krishna's name. It becomes a constant flow of unlimited nectar, and then your life becomes, what we say, joyful, like that. We want that. That's what we really want. So overcoming the jantas, getting the taste, is number eight. Uh, meditation, it's also a meditation on Krishna's uh, forms, qualities, pastimes, and of course his names like that. This is the stage of asakti or bhava. It's a high stage of Krishna consciousness. But we should, all, all, whatever stage of practice we're on, we should always know the goal and what are the symptoms of each of the stages and see how, who, we can even see others who have these symptoms. Then we can understand who is practicing on what level, like that. And we can also aspire for these stages. We can't imitate them. You can't simply try to make these symptoms that are characteristics of the higher stages, such as, you know, 
uh, constantly chanting the holy names of the Lord and constantly uh, associating with Krishna through various services, we can't just imitate that. Krishna consciousness, you can't force it. You can look ahead and see what, what it's like, and you can see what you need to do from where you are to get to the next step like that. You can also jump a little bit. You can get the Hanuman leap into your, into your uh, bhakti. <laughs> the Hanuman leap comes when you intensify your hearing and chanting like that. When you start to really absorb yourself in hearing and chanting, His Holiness Sachi Nandana Maharaj has opened up a very wonderful part of our Krishna consciousness society by creating these kirtan malas, japa retreats, concentrated opportunities to associate with people who have taste for the holy name and absorbing ourselves more and more. Uh, what is it, the 30th uh, is, is um, our temple president? Is he here? Is he hiding behind a pillar? Or something? He's gone. You're having Kirtan Mela here, right? What weekend is that? The last weekend in May. May, May 30th? Hmm? For Nijala Kalasi. Perfect time. Perfect time. And that's on uh, 30th and 31st and 1st of June. Yeah, those three days. Uh, so devotees, many of the kirtaniyas from the local area and others will be coming for two and a half days full of intensified kirtan. So that really, and that helps us to take away a taste and an understanding of what it means to practice bhakti. A real taste for Krishna's holy name. We want that taste. The taste is available. Krishna's making that taste available through the association of his devotees who have that taste. But we have to just absorb ourselves. The process of absorbing is the process of hearing. Concentrated hearing brings about a taste because concentrated hearing focuses the mind on something that is the ultimate principle of happiness, which is Krishna and the Holy Name. When we concentrate, we have to force ourselves sometimes. We have to force ourselves to hear. We have to force ourselves to chant. But force is natural. Why? When you force yourself to do something that you're supposed to do, then you're at, that force is natural because it's bringing you to what you're meant to do. <laughs> Sometimes we hear people say, oh, why, I have, why should I be artificial? Why, I just want to feel it. When it happens, let it jump out of the sky and then I'll grab it. No, you have to go for it. You have to make that effort. You have to practice the process according to how it's given and force yourself. That force becomes more natural and easy once you connect with the sound. And then it becomes easy. It's no longer a force. It becomes natural, easy. So therefore, even in, in our classes, I must say, you're going to have a hard time this weekend <laughs> because there's a lot of information. There's so much, and we're squeezing it in. We're not going to make it easy. So please stay with us and try to do your best. Bring a bottle of water to get revived every once in a while. <laughs> Because there's a lot. You look at the schedule, it's pretty intense. But that's good. Because concentrated efforts on something that is powerfully spiritual will bring about great, great spiritual benefit and great knowledge also. So please stay with it. Uh, if you need a doctor, we got any doctors here? <laughs> we got one. Ooh, okay, uh, doctor, 
she'll bring whatever you need. <laughs> and she'll bring a smile, that'll bring you back. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not trying to discourage you by saying that, but I'm just like letting you know it's a little concentrated. And um, so that's um, verse number eight, Taste for the Holy Name. Now we're going to um, 9, 10, and 11 is the higher stages. It's Bhava and Prema, verses 9, 10, and 11, affection and love. And that'll be given in one class. And I'll do that at the very end of the weekend at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. So we'll do that, and that is the glories of what are the different levels of holy places, ending in with Radha Kund. What are the different levels of devotees, ending with Srimati Radharani, and what is the different, what is the goal of all this, is to attain to the highest stage of pure devotional service, and the residence of Sri Radha Kund, who are absorbed in Radharani's Bhakti. So that's the last verse. So hang on. We're going from the most simplest to the most elevated philosophical teachings in two days. <laughs> we'll try by the grace of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srila Prabhupada and the previous Acharyas. We'll try to somehow or other bring about a little bit of the quality of this great scripture. Sometimes we just look at it, oh, it's a little paperback book that Prabhupada put out, but actually it's the whole process of pure devotional service. <laughs> so, mind and sense control, proper attitude, what is the purpose of ISKCON? What's the purpose of our society? What is guru-disciple relationship? What is association with other great souls? Different kinds of devotees and the behavior and qualifications of these devotees. And bhakti in the higher stage of development. Different stages to the highest. This pretty much makes up the, the process. So that's a little bit of the overview. Um, so Bhutta Bhavana will do one, two, six, and seven. I'll do four, five, eight, and then nine, ten, eleven in one for, in class like that. So there'll be eight classes, right? Eight classes for eleven verses. I'll do three, four, five. No, there'll be nine classes. I'll do three, four, five, eight, and then the last one. Okay. And did I leave anything out? This is an overview. Vaidhi Bhakti, or rules and regulations, are from verses 1 to 7. Raganuga Bhakti is on verse 8. And Bhava and Prema Bhakti are verses 9, 10, and 11. So, the science of Bhakti. Or the way to go from hell to heaven. <laughs> To live in the material world means to be in hell. <laughs> Just to put it succinctly. Why? Because you can't stay here, you can't fulfill your desires, and you have to be miserable while you're here. <laughs> Just the material world. You can't stop playing, and you can't win. If somebody says, play this game, you can't win, but at the same time, once you get started, you can't stop. That's called material life. <laughs> you lose, but you can't stop playing. Would you enter that game? <laughs> material life. It's just, you can't win. And even if it, whatever you win, there's an old saying in America, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> it's a bumper sticker that the Carmies put on their cars. You know. He who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> it's facetious, it's sarcastic, 
and saying that, you know, you know, you can, everything is finished at death, so get as many toys as you can while you're alive. <laughs> so, this is material life. But as soon as we enter into the process of bhakti, we enter into the process of eternal life, which is our constitutional nature. <laughs> okay, any questions? Anything? Yes, Prabhu. You know, it's interesting you asked that question. The question was, should, should we distribute nectar instructions to the non-devotees, right? Basically. And when the, when the devotees put it out, they said, and I can remember the conversation, one senior devotee was talking, for, they were talking about the book, and, and he said, yes, Prabhupada, this is just for devotees. Prabhupada said, no, it's for everyone. You should distribute this book everywhere. <laughs> I was kind of shocked also. But Prabhupada saw, see, but Prabhupada's purports kind of take the really, you know, we say difficult philosophical texts and give a very simple practical understanding of how these texts are understood in the day-to-day -day life. His purports are really simple. It's amazing how simple he applied without minimizing the importance of the text. And that's what Prabhupada understood. He wanted to give this high philosophy in a very, very simplified form to everyone. For, to the practicing devotees and to the people in general. So, so your question was answered by Prabhupada, yeah. Give them to the devotees. Give them to everyone like that. Anything, anyone, any questions, comments? Should I tell some jokes? <laughs> no questions? There must be a question. B. Features. It's a question about verse 1. I don't know if you asked today or this morning. You're discussing it with Buddha, Bhavana? On the plane. On the plane? Okay. Why not lust, greed? Yes. No. Anger is a pushing. Hmm. Hmm. The desire, you get that feeling. See, the, 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 the verse is the six vagams. Vagams are urges. They come naturally. So anger, anger is just simply frustration over unfulfilled desires. That's basically a definition of anger. So that happens. Everyone has, even great souls have anger, but they know how to control it, and they also know how to use it for spiritual gain. <laughs> but uh, generally, we find that, you know, that principle of anger is there. Sometimes we, don't, sometimes we get angry, and we don't even know we're angry. We get the, the feelings of anger build up in us, and it doesn't really express itself, but it makes our eyes and our, the lips get real tight. <laughs> and we just say, <laughs> and we walk away without it. <laughs> so that's anger, and it happens in all different levels of experience. <laughs> it's natural. You can't stop the element of anger. All you can do is purify it and make it transcendental. Like that. So these pushings are there. Three for the body, right? And three for the, the mind, right? Is that correct? Tongue, genital, belly and genitals for the body, anger, words, and speech for the... The, the mind, yeah. Like that. 
Uddhubhavana will give us a real detailed explanation of each one tomorrow morning, starting at 8 o'clock. <laughs> so, yeah, you can see how anger is there. It's just natural. But, as Krishna says in Gita, if it's not, if it comes in the, connected to the mode of passion, when anger gets into the mode of passion, it destroys the person and it destroys everything around it. You know, we see countries get angry with other countries because of unfulfilled expectations, desires, or, or just enviousness. And then that's connected to the mode of passion. And then what happens? There's hatred. The younger brother of unfulfilled desire is hatred. And hatred turns into, you know, anger in the form of various outweigh expressions, sometimes in the form of wars. <laughs> so Krishna says, Raja, what is it? Raja Mahashana Mahapapa Videha Vihavarinam Kama Asia Krota Asia Rajaguna Samudbhava Go ahead Mahashapna Mahapapam Videha Vihavarinam that Arjuna asked the question what causes a person to act even they know it's wrong. You know something is wrong, but still you act and, and you do it anyway. What, what's the cause of that? And then Krishna says, it's lust. So what is lust? Lust is our natural love for Krishna diverted towards the material energy. The love for Krishna is like a raging river going towards the Supreme. It's full. It's powerful. But when that same love is no longer going in the right direction, it goes towards material things. That's called lust. And that lust causes us to act and do things that we don't even we know are wrong. And Krishna says when that same lust comes into the contact with the mode of passion, then it turns into anger. And then that anger is destruction of the whole world. Krishna gives a very strong statement in the third chapter of Bhagavad Gita. 336, 337, you can look up those two verses. So yeah, therefore, you know, we see, we see sometimes you really have a lot of affection and care for someone, but you get angry and you say something that you, you didn't really mean. It just happens because of the spur of the moment or circumstances or whatever causes it. And you feel so bad. And sometimes it even has ripples of effect that lasts for, for years. Especially if you say the wrong, it's something that is really, you know, offensive. Or even do something like that. That's why that, that has to be controlled. And Bhutta Bhavan will tell us how to control it. <laughs> I'm, I'm lo looking forward to the class tomorrow. How did you answer that in your... your uh, <laughs> Right. So by controlling the, the urge of the mind, you can control all these. Then. Mm -hmm. Which is right, which is correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Learn how to control the mind, and then you can control all these urges. <laughs> Okay, any other questions? Sri Devi? Maharaj, I was thinking that if one is sincerely practicing the process, then should one expect to go from one stage to another? 
but speaking of myself and many uh, others we see around in ISKCON especially, everyone has been practicing maybe some 30 years, 40 years, but we don't see a progression. Some people seem to be stuck. Yeah. We ourselves seem to be stuck at the first one. Yeah, you get stuck. So what is the cause of getting stuck? Oh. <laughs> I don't want to give you an easy answer. <laughs> I could give you an easy answer and say, stick around for the weekend and you'll find out. <laughs> the, the difficult answer, or the more correct answer is um, attachment to the temporary. Attachment to, to, to temporary things in this world. Not just yeah, attachment to them. I refuse to give up my sense gratification. I'm determined. Guru Maharaj, me and you are going only that far. That's it. <laughs> See, the Guru is trying to drag you. And you're saying, well... I'll be dragged a little bit, but don't pull too far. Because, <laughs> you know, it kind of hurts. <laughs> so attachment to the temporary causes one to think in the wrong way, and then also one commits offenses. And when one commits offenses, then their spiritual life goes, is, is checked. And if one doesn't rectify the fences, the achieved spiritual life is stopped. <laughs> so one has to, you know, nothing, nothing can check your spiritual life if you somehow or other follow the process. But if you don't, then you have to see what is the cause of that. Okay, so, but Krishna consciousness is so nice, it's just like when you bring in the sun, the darkness goes away. So when you bring in the light of Krishna through the process of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, then all these other things become insignificant. Prabhupada always would emphasize the positive. We have to understand what is the negative, but at the same time, we emphasize the positive. More chanting, more association, more hearing, more service, <laughs> more and better. Not only more, but better. <laughs> let me do more, let me do better. And then all the darkness gradually goes away. <laughs> So when you see people who have been around for so long and still they're not moving forward, that means, <clears throat> you know, they're, they're just, they either committed offenses and are not doing anything to rectify it, or they're just attached to their level of practice and don't want to go any farther. <laughs> But the thing is, the process is, it works like this. If you're swimming, you're swimming upstream. Because the, the, the current of the material world will push you towards more and more material life. So there has to be a conscious effort on our part to move forward. We can't relax. You can't go to the party and sit in the corner and watch everybody else have a good time. <laughs> you have to take part in the party too. <laughs> it's not a spectator sport. <laughs> you got to jump into it. Get wet. Throw yourself in. Chant, dance, serve, get involved. The mind always gives us reasons why not. That's why the mind has to be controlled by the 
direction of the spiritual master like that. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Krishna consciousness is fun. <laughs> it is a lot of fun. Devotees used to say, those who really want to enjoy life, they become devotees. <laughs> they're the most, they're the ones that are most interested in sense gratification. Devotees, because devotees know how to, know what real sense gratification is. They know, they're party animals. <laughs> To put it in the very <laughs> Krishna consciousness is a party. <laughs> Prabhupada said it's a party every day. Chant, dance, take prasad, and uh, meet nice people. It's far out. <laughs> it's 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 natural. What does Krishna do in the spiritual world? That's what we do here. The same thing. <laughs> he's, you know, he's milking cows, he's playing with girls, he plays with his friends, <laughs> you know, he herds cows, his mother, you know, hides, he, he, he steals butter. It's all play. The whole program is play. And Krishna's saying, come on, play with me. <laughs> Just play with me. And you'll have the most, you'll have the best party you ever had. <laughs> So he's inviting us into that eternal play through the process of practicing now, like that. So ISKCON is a microcosm of the spiritual world. We're trying to create that environment of the spiritual world right here within this society. Through hearing about Krishna, chanting about Krishna, associating with Krishna's devotees, eating nice Krishna prasadam, and thinking of so many ways to do service. <laughs> it's a party. <laughs> and guess what? The party doesn't end. <laughs> it doesn't end. <laughs> it just keeps going. Prabhupada is talking. Chant. Dance. Take Prashad. That's all. But Prabhupada, we have so many work, so much work to do. No work. Chant, dance, prashad. But Prabhupada, there's so many things we have to do. There's no work in Krishna consciousness. It's all chanting, dancing, feasting. Us. Devotees were challenging for him. Prabhupada stuck to his point. He didn't change. <laughs> he answered like that. Preachers. Mm -hmm. um, that That's what I want to know. <laughs> what keeps us attached to the material world? I don't know, maybe because we are used to it. You know, just like, <clears throat> give you an example. In Mumbai, a lot of the people live in these slums. And uh, maybe that's not a good example. Example is, uh, uh, okay. Prabhupada tells this one story where one man, he's a fish, he sells fish. And uh, so he's looking for a place to stay at night. He comes to one house. The man says, yeah, okay, you can come, but leave your fish basket outside. <laughs> so he leaves his fish basket outside. And all night he can't sleep. He can't sleep. So the, his host says, what's wrong? You come. You're not even sleeping. You're staying away at night. He said, I, gotta, I cannot sleep unless I smell that fish. I just have to smell that fish. That's the only way I can take rest. <laughs> he 
he's used to his, you know, his attachment. And therefore, whether it's good or not, we're used to it. <laughs> it's like a habit, right? We get in uh, material life is like a bad habit. <laughs> But that's all because we are used to it. We just keep going in that same way. But Krishna is saying, oh, okay. All right, try this for a while. Develop another habit. Develop a spiritual habit. And then when that habit becomes stronger than our material habit, the other material habit starts to fade like that. So, but we're just accustomed to material life, that's all. We call it attachment, we call it familiarity, like that. I was thinking of the example like the bungies, they live in the slums, and if you tell them, we'll give you a nice house to stay in, they say, no, give me, I'll stay in my slum. <laughs> because that's what they like. They're used to it. Yeah. Yeah. But people get attached to their situation. Yeah. They're living in a particular place, they're miserable. You try to say, here, I'll give you a better place, you'll be happy. No, I like my misery. <laughs> it's attachment, that's all. But Krishna consciousness is meant to bring us to a different kind of attachment, <laughs> or a better attachment. Radharani is so attached to Krishna, she can't do, think, or even imagine anything else. She can't. She cannot stop thinking of Krishna, she cannot stop thinking how to serve Krishna, and she cannot do anything else but act for the pleasure of Krishna. It's impossible for her to do anything else. She couldn't possibly do anything else. It's not. It's impossible. She's so absorbed in Krishna, that's all she can do. <laughs> that's Radharani. So that's an indication of that when you get so absorbed in something, it becomes everything to you. Like that. So Krishna consciousness is meant to gradually bring us to that absorption. <laughs> More and more, through association, through hearing, through chanting, through prasadam, through service, like that. Okay, is it? Yeah. Anandam buddhi vardhanam. Ananda buddhi vardhanam. It's an ocean of happiness. Can you measure an ocean? Try it. <laughs> Take one billion gallons out of the Pacific Ocean and see if it changes the ocean. <laughs> it won't. You can scoop one billion gallons out of that ocean and it looks the same. <laughs> because it's, uh, it's practically, from, the from a material point of view, it has reached a level of unlimitedness. The sky, can you really measure the sky? You can just keep going and going and going. It's, the sky is expansive. Can you measure the ocean? You can try. <laughs> can you measure the happiness of Krishna consciousness? Not possible. It's not possible. It's so, the happiness of Krishna consciousness is greater than Krishna. Did you know that? <laughs> because he wants to taste it too. <laughs> so he becomes Lord Chaitanya just to taste it. <laughs> He's eager for that same happiness. <laughs> Figure that one out. <laughs> Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is, you know, he's... He's in the mood of Radharani's love for himself. And he's just trying to taste it. <laughs> He can't get enough of it himself. There's no limit. 
in this world, everything you see is limited. <laughs> some of it is really limited, <laughs> and some of it is more or less limited than others, but still it's limited. But Krishna, there's no limit. I gave a talk, what was it, last night or the night before? The night before. And I was telling, I was in, I was saying, uh, if, if you use your money for Krishna, you get more. You use your time for Krishna, he gives you more time. You use your energy for Krishna, he gives you more energy. And you use your intelligence for Krishna, you get more intelligence. So I was speaking like that. So at the end, somebody came up to me and gave me a donation and said, here, I'm giving you some money because I want to get some more. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was, wasn't my intention. <laughs> but he was nice about it, though. <laughs> he made the point. <laughs> and that's true. You know, I know one devotee, he was a millionaire when he came to Krishna consciousness. Now he's a millionaire eight times over because he's just been using his time and money to, to support the, the Krishna conscious movement, became a devotee himself, got initiated, and now he's getting more and more money because <laughs> Krishna's saying, oh, you're using the money for my service? Here, here's some more. Use it. <laughs> like that. That's Krishna. Like that. Like that. It's unlimited. Can you remember the time you were really, completely, totally happy? Think. Sometime in your life when happiness just wrapped you in a complete ecstasy of happiness. Think about it. Can you remember that moment? We all have some moments of complete, total absorption in the mood of happiness, right? If you can remember that, just then remember one thing. That's a drop. <laughs> That's only a drop. It's not even a drop. It's, a, it's part of the drop. <laughs> it's just a very tiny part. The happiness in Krishna consciousness is so great, it'll kill you. <laughs> you, you can't live. It'll just, too much happiness, you just die. <laughs> die out of happiness. Of course, Krishna wouldn't let you do that, but... <laughs> He'll turn off the valve when it gets too much. <laughs> but <laughs> it's like that, you know. So, you know, we can, this material world is just, doesn't have anything to offer to a devotee. <laughs> it really doesn't. Any other questions, comments? Such a quiet crowd tonight. Everyone's very quiet. Yes. Sandana? Sadhya. You make you can make progress in good times and in difficult times, but you make more progress in difficult times <clears throat> because you then your faith is tested, your tolerance is tested, your ability to see how to advance, your intelligence is also tested. So, Bhaktivinoda Kors gives a nice, he says, he, in one of his songs in Saranagrati, <clears throat> he starts to speak 
like, do you ever kind of speak rhetorically? You know, rhetorically means you kind of make statements and you try to answer those statements by the statements. <laughs> what is my happiness in Krishna consciousness? And finally, after going through all the things that he thinks are happiness, he says, my happiness in Krishna consciousness, my dear Lord, he's praying to Krishna, he says, my happiness in Krishna consciousness is the difficulties I encounter in your service. <laughs> That's what he says. Why? Because then I can offer you something. When it's easy, it's nice. When it's difficult, we have something to offer. So it says, there's one famous track runner. She said, <clears throat> difficulties only come to the chosen few. <laughs> Yes. In other words, <clears throat> there's people in life, in the material life, that like challenges. They like difficulties because they know that brings them to a higher stage of life in whatever they're doing. Same in Krishna consciousness. Don't run from difficulties and don't look for them. It's not like you have to go out and say, I'm going to look for some difficulties. No, that's not the idea. When they come, try to accept them and understand how you can gain from them. The idea is not to run from them, and the idea is not to look for them. The idea is just to accept them and gain from them. So the difficulties cause us to take greater shelter of Krishna. <laughs> and that's what Krishna wants. He wants that he is to call out for him in helplessness. Please, I can't chant your name. I can't do it. I finally realized after 25 years I can't do it. <laughs> Sometimes it takes longer. <laughs> And then we cry out for Krishna. Krishna, save me. <laughs> Krishna, give me the, the intelligence, the guidance, whatever I need to move forward. <laughs> and you think Krishna will neglect you? No. Because that's what he's waiting for. He waits that. The conditioned soul thinks, I can do it. I'm in control. I'm in charge. <laughs> Time to die, Mr. Soul. Conditioned Soul. Ooh, I'm not in control anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you get to a situation that overwhelms you, and then you figure, I just lost control. No, you never lost control. You never had it. <laughs> But the, uh, the false ego says, I'm, I, I'm in control. So, uh, that's why we, this is called the best posture in yoga, the highest yoga posture. <laughs> Krishna, help! <laughs> Draupadi, when Draupadi was being disrobed by these big, powerful generals, soldiers, she was no match to try to keep her garments. And she was pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling, and she was losing her cloth. She didn't know what to do. Then she raised one arm, kept holding onto her cloth with one arm, and raised one arm like this and said, Hey, Krishna! And then Krishna was in Dwarka. He was playing dice with Rukmini. And Rukmini, she understood. She said, Krishna! Your devotee, he's dropping, she's calling for you. Krishna said, let's play another game of dice. She's still holding on with one hand. <laughs> she wasn't completely surrendered. It was like the one-armed surrender. Only when she threw up both arms, then Krishna acted. And then he became unlimited cloth. <laughs> he incarnated as that cloth. So that's our program we got. I'm 
still in control. <laughs> but Krishna allows you to do things and gives you the understanding that you're doing it and you're in control. But if you think like that, then he wants to give you credit. He wants to empower his devotees. He wants to give Arjuna all the credit for fighting on the battlefield. But, he, but Arjuna was not the fighter. He was simply the instrument for Krishna's will, that's all. It's the same for us. We're his instrument, that's all. You can be a good instrument, you can be a bad instrument, or you can be a mediocre one. It just depends on how much you want to surrender. <laughs> so when difficulties come, we should try to understand how to make advancement from those. We deal with the difficulties. We deal with them. We don't run from the difficulties. We may have to, just like say we get a, a legal attack and we're fighting something legal. We have to act on that level, but we should know that behind the scenes, it's Krishna who's going to make the difference. The doctor is operating on the sick, per on the sick person, but... It's not the doctor that's going to save that sick person. He's got to do his work as a doctor, but behind the scenes is, is Krishna's will that makes the doctor either successful or something different. So we don't run from situations, but we also understand that, you know, Rake Krishna Mori Ke Mori Krishna Rake Ke. Krishna is the difference between success and failure. And Prabhupada even says, even if you, you practice Krishna consciousness and you fail, and say you go out and you preach and you, you don't get much result, still, the fact that you tried is your success. Not your results, your effort. The effort you make is your success more than the results. The results are up to Krishna, as Krishna says in the Gita. You know, uh, Everything depends on me. But we try. Mother Yasoda couldn't catch Krishna, and she had pure love. Only when Krishna said, agreed to get caught, and then Krishna was caught. It wasn't, wasn't her effort alone, it was Krishna's will that made the difference. But her effort was there. Am I putting everybody to sleep? No. Everybody's tired from traveling? No? Okay. Yes. Is uh, ecstatic kirtan a stai bhava? Ecstatic care time, these are symptoms of bhava, but that doesn't mean you're on the bhava platform. <laughs> that means you can experience some of the taste of the higher mellows through the process of kirtan, but that doesn't mean you're on that platform. Even a new person who comes, first time walks into a kirtan, has ecstasy, right? Think, maybe some of you, you first came to a kirtan, and you just blew your way. You were lifted off the ground. You're tasting the higher taste of, of Krishna consciousness. But that doesn't mean I'm on that platform. That's just how you just happen to be in the right consciousness at the right time. And your soul was receptive to what is being offered like that. I mean, we taste love of God at times. We taste it. But we get a little taste, but then we're back down again. <laughs> we, when we speak of love of God as a feature, we mean that's a constant thing, not just a taste. It's a feast. It doesn't stop. So, yeah, we go to kirtans and we get a, we get bhava, we taste bhava. Yeah. Provided your consciousness is, you know, in that mood. So you can taste the higher mellows. 
You see, Prabhupada wanted two pictures side by side. He had them drawn. Lord Chaitanya dancing in Kirtan with his disciples and followers. Krishna dancing in Rasa dance. He said there's no difference. There's no difference. Yeah. Anything else? Any questions? I'm running out of things to say. <laughs> Anuradha. Yeah, that's in verse number four. They exchange loving relationships with devotees. Prabhupada said, I have established this ISKCON society in order to facilitate the six loving exchanges between devotees. So that's the purpose of ISKCON, to develop loving relationships with other Vaishnavas. <laughs> That's the purpose of our movement. <laughs> he said, we have these temples so we can all come together and, and practice the six loving exchanges like that. Like. You can do it every day. Give somebody some prasadam. That's loving. Reveal your mind in confidence. Give a gift. These are all loving exchanges. Tell somebody about Krishna. Hear somebody else speak about Krishna. That's all loving exchanges because Krishna is the medium of the exchange. Because Krishna is the medium, the principle is bhakti. Like that. Yes, is that okay? Okay. Yeah, that's mentioned in that verse. Buddha Bhavan, you want to answer that question? Now, now you, I, I have a feeling you can give a better answer. I just have this feeling. Okay, you got it. Yeah, uh, is there a microphone you can give him? I have a feeling he knows the answer. Okay, so the question was, Sri Devi asked, can we have loving exchanges with non-devotees? <laughs> First of all, in terms of nectar instructions, they should explain that by the association, that really determines what will happen to us in the future. So the first thing is, that is there's a difference between giving up association and taking association. So for those who themselves are not practicing Krishna consciousness, we want to give our association such... Yeah. Isn't it what? Oh, it's better. Okay. So, for those who are themselves not practicing Krishna consciousness, we want to give association in such a way that they become inspired to move forward or to come closer to Krishna. But we do not want to take on their material values. Because if we do that, then we actually go down rather than bringing them up. So we can give... We, can give, we give non-devotees prasadam. That we give non-devotees Prabhupada's books. We give our own association in such a way that they can understand that Krishna is there for them and that they are part and parcel of Krishna. But we don't take on their materialistic values because that brings us down. Is that okay, much? Yeah. <laughs> That's why I asked you to answer it. <laughs> yeah, and we don't accept their association, but we also give them the association. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada talks about that in the purport of that fourth, fourth verse, like that. So <clears throat> the question, the answer is really no, right? Yes, no. The answer is no. <laughs> no. 
Anything else? Yes, sir. Rishikena, Rishikesha, Sevana Bhakta Uchyate. Um, the senses are put, up, put under the control of Rishikesh. Rishikesh means the master of the senses. So when you put your senses under the control of the master of the senses, your senses are controlled. <laughs> so that means you use your senses for the service of Krishna. Then they're controlled. <clears throat> a devotee doesn't even have to try to control his senses. A non-devotee has to struggle. A neophyte devotee has to struggle. But a devotee who's fixed in Krishna doesn't have to even try to control his senses because they're automatically controlled. Simply because he's fixed only on one thing, service to Krishna. So when you get to when you practice Krishna consciousness, your senses don't even go to sense objects anymore because you're just focused on Krishna or devotional service like that. When <clears throat> when one reporter said to Prabhupada, Prabhupada was he had come, and the devotees had greeted Prabhupada in uh, in an airport and they had brought a Vyasasan to the airport. <laughs> they did that. And Prabhupada got a real special welcome, you know, he was sitting on a Vyasasan and everywhere Prabhupada arrived and the reporters would also be there. So this was in New York, I think it was. And one reporter, he was a little envious of Prabhupada. And sometimes, you know, their enviousness, they, they, they have to express it. So he said, why do you sit on that fancy seat? <laughs> Obviously, he was thinking, you know, why don't you give it to me? <laughs> when someone asks, well, why do you, you know, why do you look so nice? That means I want to look nice, not you. <laughs> That's really <laughs> something like that. Anyway, Prabhupada said that he answered in the most interesting way. And there was other reporters there. Prabhupada said, the difference between me and you is I can be in a room full of naked women and not be disturbed. <laughs> That's how he answered the question. And then all his colleagues laughed at him, you know. <laughs> he got the message. And Prabhupada was transcendental to all these things that go on in this material world that everyone's attached to. He doesn't get disturbed by these things. And Prabhupada wanted to make the point, not that he wanted to show his spiritual, you know, acumen. He wanted to make the point that, I, you know, these things don't affect me. I just accept them because they're there, because my disciples are giving it to me to honor me. But he answered in that way because the reporter wanted it was was envious. He he wanted to put Prabhupada on a spot by trying to make him look like he's interested in material opulence. Prabhupada just said, you know, I'm not affected by these things. So that's the nature of a transcendental person. They're not attached to anything that what people are attached to in this world. And then they're not averse to anything either. They're just fixed on a higher platform. <laughs> so controlling the senses simply means to, con to engage the senses in the service of the Lord. That's all. And when the senses are fixed in the service of the Lord, and then they're not diverted to anything else. That has to be, that's the perfection like that. So, how do we do that? We, we pray, my dear Lord, please don't let me get attracted to this material world, let me get attracted to you.
There's that verse in the Bhagavad Gita. One who sees gold and pebbles on the same level, they're fixed. Gold is gold and pebbles is just ordinary rock. They don't see any difference because it's both material. <laughs> they're not eager for the gold and not trying to avoid the pebbles, you know. So that's, that means the senses are no longer... Senses are two things. They're either serpents or servants. A serpent will bite and cause death. A servant will assist and elevate you. So make your senses your servants, not your... Sen don't let them, you know, drag you this way and that way. Fix your mind on Krishna. Fix your mind on devotional service. And as you come in contact with the, the sense objects in this world and you find yourself being attracted to them, just realize it's just an illusion. <laughs> so, you're thinking, oh, it's going to bring me happiness. But it, it's not. It looks like it's going to bring you happiness. That's called maya. Maya means what... What appears to be something, but it is something different. That's that's the word. That's the real definition of Maya. It's going to give me what I I'm looking for, but it's not really going to give me what I'm looking for. It's like, I mean, is the world ha any happier? <laughs> people have. I mean, people are expert at sense gratification, right? I mean, there's some sense gratification gurus out there. I mean, there are people think of ways to enjoy their senses. So, is anybody any happier? Does it look like the world's happier? No. That's an indication that sense gratification just doesn't make it. <laughs> it just doesn't work. <laughs> because it's just not our nature. That's why. You tell a fish, hey, Mr. Fish, Got a nice house for you. I got you know. I got you. I got you a gold fish vyasa on for you. You can sit on. You know. You got some gold fish cups and all kinds of nice things. Just come out of the water, and I'll give you all these nice. The fishes think if I go out of the water, I'll die. Right. So. The material world is a place where we're in unnatural. It's unnatural to be here. That's all. So, make the best use. Become Krishna conscious. That's all. The question we have to ask ourselves, what am I looking for in life? <laughs> what am I looking for? That's a question everyone should ask themselves. Honestly, what do I really look, what do I really want in life? A better material situation or a position in devotional service? What am I really looking for? And then you know the answer because you, you can't cheat yourself. You know, you know the answer. You'll answer the question if you ask it sincerely, what do I really want? Do I really want you, Krishna? Or do I just really want you to provide for me the things of this world? <clears throat> and that's many of the religious <clears throat> uh, programs today, is that you worship God for some matter of material situation. But that's not Krishna consciousness. <clears throat> Krishna consciousness says, we got something even better than what this material world's got. <laughs> Try for it. It's, it's much better. It's not like, well, if you worship God, he's going to just you know, make everything nice for you. <clears throat> yeah, he may, but that's, not, that's like his outer office. <laughs> Want to get into the inner office? <laughs> you 
you can have God's opulences or you can have God. The question is, which one do we want? Do we want what he can give us or do we want him? <laughs> That's the question, do we want? Do we want him or do we want what he can provide for us? So, so when you find the answer, then you'll know how to move forward in life. Good question, huh? Scary. Anything else? Yes, uh, No, don't no, don't bother him. Don't bother him with that. <laughs> He'll give you whatever you need if you practice your devotional service. Anayan chinta yanto mam ye jana paru pasate teshan nitya bhyuktanam yoga shema vahamiyaham. Not only does he provide it, he provides it directly. He's giving us everything we need. We shouldn't ask him for these things. We shouldn't ask him only for service. If you ask for service and then he'll and he gives you the service, he'll also give you the facilities to carry out your service. That'll come with the service. I wouldn't bother him for that. <clears throat> okay. Oh, okay. So we're getting close to the end. We're going to try and end by 8 o'clock. Okay. Yes. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just, just accept it and work with it. Whether Krishna does it directly or Krishna is doing it through Maya, he's doing it. <laughs> he's also the controller of Maya. <laughs> he says, Mama Maya, it's my Maya. <laughs> Works under my direction. <laughs> Either way, it's coming from him, directly or indirectly. Don't try to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mark, you mentioned earlier about challenges. So the question I want to ask is if one is in a, a situation which is challenging, how does one understand whether it's challenging because Krishna wants him to leave the situation or it's challenging because Krishna wants him to stay into a kind of. <laughs> Good question. I think in those cases, advice m might be helpful. When you can't really understand whether to move on or stay with it. One of the things that he can prevent you from doing that, getting into that quandary, is that whatever situation you're in, if it's authorized, in other words, if you authorized it, it's not authorized. <laughs> If it's authorized by your spiritual master, then it's authorized. That's why we always say, don't don't do the don't don't do it something independently, and then when things go wrong, you wonder, well, did I do the right thing? If you're working under the guidance of the spiritual master or the spiritual master's representatives, then you're working on under superior guidance, and then whatever you're doing is you're getting that kind of. Uh, uh, you know, facility to carry out your service. And then if you get challenged, then you know I'm in the right spot because this is what I'm supposed to do. But then if you act independently, when you run into an obstacle, then, you, then you'll come to that question. Lord Chaitanya, when he wanted to go to South India, 
he wanted to leave Jagannath Puri. He wanted to travel to Vrindavan. I think it was Vrindavan or South India. He asked his devotees for permission to leave. And they said no. <laughs> he said, it's the rainy season. Jagannath Ratha Yatra is coming up. Please stay. Chaturmasya. So he agreed. And then at the end, he asked again. They said no. <laughs> Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, King Prajapur, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya, and who else? Ramananda Roy. And they were acting on behalf of all the devotees. So the Lord stayed again. And it came around to the following year. And he asked again. <laughs> and it was again the time for the Ratha Yatra. So they, again they told him no. <laughs> so three times, and then the fourth time he just went anyway. <laughs> He decided, he, oh, he understood that they were just keeping him there because they didn't want him to leave. <laughs> they were too attached to his presence. So, yeah, but the Lord wanted to show by example that when you're going to make an important decision in your life, better to get blessings from others. <laughs> that way you can, you know if, that the challenges that come with that important decision are also part, part of moving forward. Like that. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't take much. I had an experience with your Guru Maharaj. I talk about it all the time, where I had that thing, and then when I spoke to Bhakti Tirtha Swami, he, he pretty much gave me the answer, and was the answer that I had heard previously, but wasn't able to recognize it until I heard it, the way he expressed it. It came directly from. Krishna. So, <clears throat> yeah, when you hear it, the right answer, whether move on or stay with it, then you know it's, it's the right thing. It's Krishna coming through the devotees. The mind will trick you. <laughs> the mind, will, mind is always tricking us. <clears throat> At least it's trying to, anyway. See, Maya knows your weaknesses. She knows exactly where you are weak. And it's like being in a, a fight. She hits you right where you're weak. And it's the same spot. <laughs> and then you cover that spot, and then she finds another weak spot. <laughs> so why is she doing that? Because she wants to make us stronger, that's so. And then you protect yourself in one way, and then, then you become stronger like that. So the mind will trick us into thinking in some way that it may not, it may look like the right thing, but it may not be. That's why association with devotees is so essential, so we don't go off track. So important. 